What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we're bringing you Block Digest episode 225 at block height 635,590 on Saturday, June 20th. So what is cracking today, Jenny? Oh, you know, just uh, spent a little bit of time researching a new hire at a company who recently had a data breach and finding out that, um, yes, they... Uh, have worked for a bunch of agencies. <laughs> That'll be fun to get into. Uh, so always, aside from that, um, it's always a great way to build trust with your customers. The the world otherwise staying sane over on your side of the pond. Oh yeah, it's uh, it's staying so sane that. As far as we've seen, there's basically been no repercussions for the fact that people are have, are partying and gathering outside bars for the past month. Um, well, that sounds more fun than the U.S. right now. Um, <laughs> I woke up today, and um, it finally happened. Uh, there was a shooting in the uh the chaz or the chop whatever you want to call it autonomous zone and uh one person is dead now so uh we that, those that's... goddamn anarchists isn't it we're like fucking gangbangers most likely but that oh, that's well... gonna be fun to see the reaction to I thought the public enemy number one right now was anarchists, because apparently, like, there's so many of us that were clearly behind all the chaos, according to Orange Man. Um, well, there were, in the sense of nutty, um, left-leaning ones, but, you know, that aside, um, kind of brought this all up to, uh comment on an interview i saw uh with hotep jesus and raz um the oh, supposed warlord of the the zone and i actually want everybody who is paying attention to that who hasn't seen that interview to actually go watch that interview and listen to the man speak for himself because honestly, like just two things I want to pull out of that, um, you know, by his description, he isn't really a political person in terms of left or right or caring about that entire spectrum. And interestingly, um, he didn't even know what Antifa was until like a week or two ago. And he didn't step up by his own um, telling and assert himself as an authority in that space. He just had people start treating him that way because he was actively involved. And quite frankly, um, with how rapid and organized and tied to Antifa groups in Seattle, the initial setting up of that zone was... Um, I think it's very strange to hear Raz's tale of how he wound up in the position he is there because to me, it seems like he was just steered into that spot to be a fall guy, for lack of a better word, or the, the guy out in front because other people were too scared to do that themselves. So have they like uh, figured out how to make food yet? Or are of they still getting not. pizza from neighbors? 
Of course not. They're still getting supply runs and setting up their their food stations and shit. But you know, I'm 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 serious though. It's like I I really think regardless of your attitude about that entire situation, I have been pretty vocal about ridiculing it and pointing out the complete lack of forethought or, or planning. But you know, after watching that, I. I still see somebody who I consider reckless and not thinking, but I do not see the caricature of him that has been painted in the media the last couple weeks. Well, I don't know what caricature of which you speak, because as soon as I read a few sentences about what was going on there and the fact that they don't even have a food source and they claim to be autonomous, I'm like, okay, not interesting anymore. <laughs> From the point of view of like nothing, nothing long lasting or revolutionary is actually going to come of this thing. Yeah, and I agree. But the point is, I think that there are actually people there trying to find a way to do that they all just kind of fumbled into this as something they had nothing to do with actually setting up they just came to but yeah bitcoin news time yes let's get to it Alrighty. uh so this is um Another instance of fractal speed of of things. Um, developers slow the fuck down, okay? It's like it's hard to keep up at this point. Um, quarantine kickstarted a Bitcoin renaissance. Um, is, is the only way I can put this. Um, recent rapid pace of all kinds of crazy shit being dropped all over the place. But uh, one of these things is a proposal um it's not really a, dis a defined protocol or spec um more an open discussion of possible designs and issues to be worked out but um coin pool is pretty much a, a generalized um i guess one level uh channel factory so just a, a multi-party um payment channel in my mind and kind of the basic protocol is just looking at a very simple, basic implementation that isn't stacking all kinds of uh, channels on channels on top of the base of it. And just having this one layer uh, multi-party channel where everybody can just shift balances between each other. And really the most concrete um, aspect of the design proposal is really down to the the logistics of um being able to exit non-interactively and the design is looking at um assumptions of schnorr and taproot and i can't really see any way that this works without um l2 with sig hash no input because the the trying to do something like this based on penalty transactions would just become an insane fractal mess. But the, the basic design is just to have the top level um, Schnorr key with a, a taproot tree under it that would have all the different um, potential combinations of people wanting to get out of the, the coin pool and leave everybody else in that so that they can continue operating. So, like, let's say, you know, you, me, um, and Rick, Janine, uh, we're all in a coin pool. You would need a path where I could pull my money out and still leave you and Rick inside. You could pull your money out and leave me and Rick inside. And me and Rick, um, or no, wait, um, or Rick could pull his money out and leave you and me inside. So you need three um, different potential paths in that taproot tree to get uh, your money out without requiring activity. And, you know, the assumption would be L2 um, versioning that so that any old state could be dealt with on chain. And you can kind of see this puts an upper bounds on the number of participants practically. Um, the proposal uh, from Antoine Riard is looking at 10 people 
um, with the, this very basic design, just because of how big the, the taproot tree and the number of possibilities would get. But, you know, it's a very simple thing um, without really too much logic. Um, you would be able to, you know, obviously run these publicly where people could try to join at any time or, you know, a completely private pool that's not advertised anywhere um, and want to deal with uh, Sybil attacks, um, potentially like uh, ch chain analysis or surveillance companies um, trying to join a pool because without a view into the, the pool balance off chain, you know, a cooperative um, interaction with the main chain doesn't really leave any trace. And, you know, assuming Schnorr and Taproot and L2, I mean, this is something that could reasonably be deployed in the next couple of years. And they even talk um, about potential privacy uses um, for mixing coins through constructs like this. So, you know, as long as we get those two features, um, the Schnorr and Taproot BIP, and then SIG hash no input gets worked out so that L2 can be used, uh, we could actually wind up with very basic um, one-level channel factories in the next couple of years. Woohoo. Woohoo is right. Going in my I... newsletter. In fact, it's already in there, if you can find it. I mean, you know, and this, this could actually be doubly useful in the sense of, um, you know, end user um, utility, as well as just infrastructure utility for the Lightning Network, like uh, a bunch of uh, routing nodes that have good uptime and reputation um, could start bundling into coin pools like this to much more efficiently use their liquidity um, for routing payments across the network. And then also, you know, this would be very useful in kind of small, tight knit communities or like high trust environments just to be able to transact off chain efficiently um, and be efficient with your UTXO and your on chain management. Because, you know, a tight knit community you shouldn't really have to worry about disruptive, um, you know, things taking you to chain. Yeah, no, one of the parts that I looked at, because um, they mentioned that um, pools might have to employ, um, quote, extra civil resistance measures, and they mentioned um, fidelity bonds and then something called PODL, which I had never heard of. So I had to spend like 30 minutes looking for PODL and it took me a while because pretty much everyone who references Poddle does not explain what it is, the actual words. So I eventually found it on a join market blog post that used a picture of a poodle, which makes perfect sense. So yes, when you when you think of a proof of discrete log equivalence, think of poodles. Acronym. But you know, it's like, yeah, that I mean that really that is gonna be the real big challenge for channel factories outside of you know high trust environments is it just takes one jackass to start disrupting things for everybody and if you want to really maximize the the utility of it you want as many people in a, a channel factory or a coin pool as possible and so but yeah i mean i i've spent a lot of time just brainstorming down that rabbit hole and i i don't see any way around um you know you, you got to use webs of trust like there's no real other way to address that and that's going to be a very complicated thing because you want it to be as private as possible and not just blast a bunch of metadata out for the whole world Alrighty though want to slide along into a pretty awesome um, real world project. Yep. So I hope I'm not butchering his name too badly, but um, Chimizi uh, Chuta from Nigeria, he's the, the head of uh, Block Space uh, Technologies Africa Inc., is releasing a kit 
um, for pretty much a completely off the grid, um, for the most part, uh, Bitcoin and Lightning node that's built around a, a solar panel um, for independent power. And <laughs> this is seriously the most awesome shit in the world. Um, it, it's going to be the equivalent of, you know, 500 something dollars um, in USD. Um, it's 210,000 um, Naira, um, the Nigerian currency. But this is not something that he is kind of putting together as a product for just literally everybody to buy for their own personal use. And that's why I'm so fucking excited about this. And when you, when you really look at publicly accessible nodes in the world, there, there's really almost nothing in Africa. And I mean, as far as publicly known, um, he is one of the only people in Africa running a lightning node. And kind of the mentality that he's coming at this from isn't so much every single Bitcoin user for now um, running their own node. It's, you know, trusted or, or reliable people in a community being able to run that node um, and offer services or extend the, the utility of that to other people in the community. And, you know, the core point of that is that the, the operator of those services or that infrastructure needs to be able to, to fully validate and be a fully sovereign entity on the Bitcoin network, or they wind up in kind of subtle um, servitude to whoever they depend on for access to those network services. And this is exactly you know, how I've been thinking for years, bringing Bitcoin to these you know, really impoverished parts of the world, this is how people should think about that. It's not trying to put the smartphone and get somebody in Africa who makes a dollar a day transacting on chain every day. It's, you know, link people into this network, this infrastructure stack in the way that's efficient and works for them most beneficially. And that's a whole spectrum of trade-offs and so it, it's just really exciting to me to see entrepreneurs on that continent really start thinking in terms of practical what can be done now and what can actually benefit people practically now and not trying to export that that purest attitude that if you interact with Bitcoin in any way whatsoever, it has to be exactly like I do. Get people, you know, plugged into Bitcoin in the best way for them. It's, it's not a one size fits all solution. Ah, I wonder what chaos Janine's cat caused now. So what chaos did the kitten cause today? Who caused what chaos? Is it my turn now? Mm-hmm. Sorry, I had the wrong window selected. Um, wait, Casa caused chaos? You think that caused chaos? No, the kitty. Oh, no, that, that was not it. Um, no, that was something else. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so Casa on the 15th announced that they have a new mobile wallet. Um, and Michael Haley from their uh, product and client services uh, department, I don't know what the right word, the, the part of the company, um, wrote in an announcement that a few weeks ago we announced investment from Mantis VC, which we covered uh, recently, I think even in the last episode. Uh, which is the venture arm of the chain smokers uh, to make self-custody the norm for consumers everywhere. This week, we're excited to announce the Casa wallet. It's a secure, private, and easy self-custody wallet that's great for first-time Bitcoiners and long-time Bitcoiners. Um, and so they make the point in this announcement of advertising how the wallet is different from other wallets with four points. 
Um, I'm only going to focus on, I think, three of them, really. But uh, the first one is seedless setup. The Casa Wallet is seedless by default. We want, uh, if we want self-sovereignty to be user-friendly, we shouldn't require users to manage uh, securing and manually backing up critical data like seed phrases. Um, how does this work while still keeping our funds safe? More info in the seedless setup section below, which is linked. Um, but basically, this is uh, how it's explained in a nutshell in the post. Uh, the key is created and stored on the phone, and then an encrypted backup is split across CASA and the OS-specific cloud provider, Apple or Google. Neither CASA nor Apple or Google can access the decrypted key. This means only the user can retrieve the backup using two factors there iCloud slash Google credentials and their CASA credentials. Now, um, I'm sure that most people listening already know this, but if you don't, this is obviously a very non-standard recovery scheme, um, which, you know, regardless of whether they explain it fully and explain it well, it's still non-standard and novel. Um, they emphasize in bold in the post that... Um, CASA memberships are custom built for long time hodling with bespoke uh, service and multi location security engineered to keep your coins safe. Whereas this wallet is for securing smaller amounts of Bitcoin, and it's a great way to introduce anyone to being their own bank with Bitcoin. Um, so keep that in mind. This is a, you know, pocket change kind of wallet, not like a, you know, wallet where you would store significant amounts of funds and so going forward with all of my criticisms i'm keeping that in mind and i'm less worried about them trying an off standard backup scheme because hopefully customers take that uh notice into consideration that this is not meant for large amounts but uh it's possible they won't um uh key the, the second point i think is key health we've built the casa wallet so that new bitcoiners learn key management best practices from day one um, again, I'm a little bit eh on that because um, this is a novel scheme that is not actually part of best practices. So I'm a little hesitant to give them points for that one because at the moment the best practices involve making paper backups of your seed and they're not doing that. So I'm a little not okay with that claim. Um, but the key health part, uh, it's actually a bit more than just making the backup. They have this whole thing, this whole UX approach, uh, where they basically do checkups. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm not sure cause I haven't seen it myself. I'm not sure how useful they actually are in practice because the app is closed source. So how do you know that these checks are performing properly? What do you do if they're not working properly? Um, what is the rate of false positive or false negative or whatever for the checks actually working? Um, it At the moment, from the screenshots they provide in the post, it looks like the checkup just kind of gives you this button to contact support if something's not working. Um, and they call this a health, it's like health check stages. And one of them says the seed is stored safely which was a bit confusing to read considering they were emphasizing the seedless backup because if you're doing seedless backups then why are you telling the user that the seed is safe that doesn't seem ideal it's a bit confusing um their fourth point is casa security that you know this thing is powered by casa's multi-signature memberships over two years okay no comments really on that um, but then the last point says built for privacy and um, uh, they says, as always with CASA, no personal info is needed to sign up apart from an email and first name or alias. There's no location tracking, no data tracking and no invasive third party analytics. Um, one second as I scroll. So um, yeah, Matt, Matt Odell and I kind of voiced our concerns about this point in particular, built for privacy, because um, especially that when you consider that this section of the announcement is supposed to show how the wallet is different from other wallets, there are quite a few Bitcoin mobile wallets that don't even collect your name or email address for you to use them. 
Um, and there are also Bitcoin wallets, including mobile wallets, um, that actually have privacy features in them. Now, as far as I understand, they didn't emphasize this in the blog post, but Matt said that they had some kind of coin control features, which would be good. But that's kind of a starting point for a privacy wallet. That's not really enough to label the wallet as a privacy wallet. And they're not exactly doing that, but because they're emphasizing privacy, I think it's important to look at whether they're actually offering that. Um, so if someone is emphasizing privacy, I would expect there at minimum to be coin control. I would also expect other privacy enhancing tools and features. This app does not have that. At least they don't mention it. I don't think they have anything else as far as I understand. And they also don't allow you to connect to your own node. Uh, again, that's a privacy consideration, which, um, I mean, I think even before Samurai had the, the Noddle thing, or not the Noddle, the, uh, the dojo, dojo, I think they allowed you to connect to your own node for that, or is that not the case? I can't remember. Uh, they did, but it was only for transaction broadcasting so that your node could cross-check your like spending balance was correct yeah and and so that was a big thing that samurai was criticized for for not um you know not n not having a way to you know completely not rely on samurai servers and they've now fixed that and that's a big thing for privacy and they've done that so the fact that this wallet doesn't have that is also a big negative for privacy um and also the fact that you're relying on using Google and Apple Google and or Apple credentials for storing backups that is not that is definitely not a point for privacy. Um, so I think emphasizing privacy here was not a good choice. And so what I recommended, I mean Matt Matt just recommended them taking this section out of the announcement. Um, I just said that they should relabel it as Privacy Light, which for anyone who doesn't know, um, Privacy Light is a term. I don't know who first started using that, but I've been using it and I've seen um, a few wallets and services use it since. And Privacy Light, or not Privacy Light, KYC Light basically means that your, co uh, I mean, the, the way that's being used is mostly for services and apps that collect information that is not only very minimal, but it's stuff that you could relatively easily fake or kind of not be strictly identified to you in particular. Like your name, like they, in this instance, Casa does allow you to pick a name that's not actually yours. You could use an alias. Um, but also, you know, an email address you could potentially just set up a fresh email address somewhere that's not identified to you specifically um, that doesn't have your name in it or anything and it's just for this service which would be good phone numbers a bit harder but you could get a burner phone just for you know the purpose of bitcoin stuff and have you know tor uh, if, if you actually use it for the wallet itself on the on the device and you could have Tor or VPN by default. You know, there's a bunch of things you could do that you could plausibly still protect your identity and your privacy, even if it's collecting identifying information that some people will give that does identify them. Um, so that's what KYC Lite means. And that's essentially what I think CASA is doing with this wallet. It's collecting information that people will most, most likely the people who will use this app will probably give their names because they're not too concerned about privacy based on I don't think a lot of people who are concerned about privacy would probably choose this wallet as their main wallet um, and also giving away email address they're probably just going to do their main email address which again that's uh, identifying so I would call it KYC light I would not say that this is emphasized for privacy but in the end um, I just kind of feel ambivalent about this wallet um, Oh, something, yeah, something that they didn't include, I wish they had included in the announcement, is that this mobile app will be closed source. And Jameson talked about this before the announcement, about why they went closed source with this app. Um, the answer is basically, it's easier to get VC money if your app is closed source. And they also didn't want to put a lot of resources into fostering an open source contributor community for the app 
which it's so it's not a secret it's not like they're hiding it but i still wish they had mentioned it uh that it is closed source um but yeah in the end i'm kind of ambivalent about this because i do think it's fine as an introductory wallet um it's being marketed for small amounts so there's not a lot of risk involved um i'm also not against the seedless backup scheme but I wish that instead of complete, I, I mean, I don't know if they did completely remove the option to do mnemonic seed backups as they are used uh, conventionally, where you write them down on paper. Um, I hope they haven't. Uh, but if they did, um, you know, for people who don't want to rely on or don't have uh, Google and Apple credentials, um, I wish that is or would have been left as an option. And I get that a lot of people think that forcing um, forcing users to make them may be uncomfortable, but I also think that if you're going to teach users about the importance of backups and adhering to best practices, and also making your wallet interoperable with others so that if your service stops working, um, then it is relatively easy for them to then migrate to a different wallet and not have to, you know, hack around with the wallet or read a bunch of resource guides that may not be available if, you know, a service goes down for good. Um, I think it's important that non-digital backups of things are prioritized. So, um, yeah, I would, I would prefer that if that is the case. Um, Speaking of interoperability, um, kind of related to this, uh, something really cool that happened in the last few days is that Luke Childs is finalizing a new Electrum feature where you can import uh, BIP39 mnemonic seeds into Electrum and scan available derivation paths for existing accounts and coins to check whether um, you have any in there in which, which ones you may have used. And uh, he says that he used waltzrecovery.org, which is the guide that Rodolfo and I have been working on to build it, um, which is really cool. And so hope, uh, he's already made a demo of that. So it's already, um, it already has, you know, some integration into the interface. I don't know when, when it's planned to actually, actually be included, but I'm looking forward to that. But that was kind of off topic, but I thought this was a good spot to mention that because we're talking about backups. Yeah, I mean, that's a cool tool that's nice to have, especially with privacy wallets kind of getting into a lot of custom derivation paths these days. But, you know, I kind of circle back to the Casa stuff. Like, I mean, I, I, can't, I get where LOP is coming from as far as not having seeds be something the user is exposed to but i think we're a ways away from that and the only real sound way to do that is when we have you know single signature threshold signatures with um multi-party stuff with either schnorr or ecdsa and you have really cheap devices that can just securely generate multi-sigs like that and you can just toss somewhere spread around and people can do that instead of deal with seeds and you know i'd honestly never thought about it before in this way um because lightning wallets are starting to do this too where they shove uh, channel backups into cloud services and it's really the the simplest option available right now but given how things are going these days what happens when you get the platformed from google and completely shut out of your account and that that's where all your backups are you know like if in the case of a lightning channel like you better hope the other side is honest and you can recover from a static backup um from the point of view of like a casa wallet like that like people could potentially lose access to all of their coins if they lose the local key then yeah i mean it's still yeah so the the idea is that the the i mean i don't know what the it's kind of confusing but the seed and or the key is stored on the phone and then it's backed up on either google or apple cloud so even if you lose access to google or 
Apple, I assume you'd be able to recover it just directly from your own device because it's stored locally. Um, but yeah, I I am very resistant. Uh, like there there was even an app which I really like um, by is called Memex uh, by Worldbrain. I think it's still working and. Um, basically it was a way, it was like a knowledge management system and it was, I, I always found it so strange because it, it was an extension for, for a browser. And so it should have been, I assumed relatively easy to just do a local backup of all of that because it's running in your, it's running in your browser. Like there, there was not any like connection to a service, um, but for some reason, I haven't checked recently, but when I last was trying it out, it only allowed for cloud backups. And I thought that that was very strange um, just because I, I, I would never do that. I'm resistant to, uh, for this kind of thing, um, I am I'm very resistant to doing cloud backups, especially because there are a number of services that have done that in the past that have done it very improperly. <laughs> and so whenever you see cloud backups, that should be a red flag to look more closely because that 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 is not only a non-standard thing, but that is also a thing that if done improperly could go very badly. So I may lose, I, I'm very hesitant about um, that being a, a good feature here. I have nothing against it in principle, but not as a sole resort. Or if you are like closing off the ability to make local backups. Yeah, that that's the biggest thing for me. I have not checked whether they still allow you to do a normal seed backup on paper or not. I hope that that's the case because I think if you're going to like the the goal they say is to teach new users about um, about best practices and key management, and so. I think it would be natural, you know, if you want to have the easiest introduction possible, you do this weird novel seedless backup thing with Google and or Apple cloud, uh, also local storage. And then eventually you get to the point where they're comfortable enough using the wallet. Now they can learn about doing seed backups and paper and they'll hopefully understand why it's important. And maybe they're more likely to do it correctly because now they've had some experience with it like that would be fine but to completely eliminate it is i don't like that at all even if it's for a smount i feel like you should you should always have that option for any wallet mm -hmm. oh man all right i i feel bad beating up on on casa now i mean i don't i don't feel like it's beating up because yeah, like I, I made a very friendly suggestion to call it KYC Light, and I got no response. So, I'm burn just... it down. No, <laughs> that's that's no. I don't. I don't feel like that's justified here. I am just. I like I said. I'm <laughs> I'm ambivalent about about this. I, I mean, I think I don't. I don't think we should ever like when new stuff comes around. It's natural to be excited, but it's also natural to be skeptical because new things can also be dangerous. So, you know. Mm -hmm. Here's something to be not skeptical about, though, and it has absolutely nothing to do with my real-time lightning streaming payments from Blockstream. Nothing at all. So, um... For those who forgot, the Electrum X maintainer is an insane BSB person and went batshit and is shifting it to be um, solely BSV. Um, so that's causing a massive disruption in um, backend Electrum infrastructure. Um, so in response to that, um, the actual Electrum team um, has officially forked Electrum X and started maintaining that. But Blockstream is dropping a new alternative. Um, they actually have a fork of Electris, um, one of the um, few different uh, Electrum server um, implementations out there, um, baked into Esplora. Um, 
their open source block explorer framework. And so they have opened this up and built in um, a peer to peer discovery mechanism um, like the um, current implementations of Electrum servers have. And people with Explora instances um, can now just hook Electrum wallets at, up to them and use Explora as backend infrastructure for the Electrum ecosystem. And you can even use the light mode um, that exists and was recently brought back uh, for the block explorer functionality um, to use for your own personal wallet. And it's going to be running a little slower and isn't really uh, DOS resistant, so might not want to open that to the public. But yeah, um, I think this is pretty awesome because... Uh, yeah, that, that's always been a weird, um, kind of problem waiting to come home and roost. I think, uh, that the maintainers of Electrum X were pretty much, uh, B cachers and it finally did. Um, and so it's, it's really, there's a lot of different options out there now for, uh, an Electrum backend. Like there's the official Electrum X fork from the Electrum team now, EPS, uh, Bitcoin wallet tracker, uh, the original Electris instance now Explora. Um, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, the, the, the protocol that the, the wallet uses to talk to the back end, I think is getting kind of cemented as a standard of sorts across the space. And anybody who listens to me knows that I like standards and I think there should be more of them so that things work properly together. Uh, so I would consider a company like this tossing this functionality out to the public uh, for a project they're already maintaining uh, a pretty awesome sign that we're we're getting more standards mm-hmm it was it was kind of funny to read the because uh, I think someone actually opened an issue and was like what the fuck is this why are you switching to BSV and it's like this is the real Bitcoin <laughs> Like, yep, I have been waiting for that for quite a while. <laughs> so, are we ready to dive into yet another aspect of the Bitcoin privacy renaissance that's going on at rapid machine gun pace? Mm hmm. So, ZMN SCPXJ, um, the infamous rando lightning developer, um, has dropped a pretty interesting fusion of two different concepts going on. Um, Belker's recent coin swap proposal and the Wabi Sabi uh, proposal uh, from Nothing Much and some people from Wasabi. And this is indeed very interesting. Um, so you know, CoinJoin is an obfuscation mechanism where you merge all of your inputs together in a single identifiable transaction to obscure relations to the outputs. And CoinSwap is effectively just trading independent, uncrossed coin histories in an undetectable swap. Well, what ZMN is pretty much uh, talking about here is a, a hop of multiple coin swaps in the kind of way that Belker's proposal is talking about routing and, and breaking am uh, amounts in independent transactions and effectively fusing that um, into a weird hybrid of Wabi Sabi, a coin swap, and a coin join, where you can actually just, um, you know, do the same kind of thing in Wabi Sabi and pass off a, a credential that allows you to register an output in this series of coin swaps um, and just create an output um, so that the, the person paying you doesn't ever actually transact directly to you. 
um, they just give you the credential to, you know, get your output in one of these transactions um, before they're all atomically signed and start hitting chain. And so, you know, just think about this, rather than everybody merge all of their inputs together and everybody seeing all of the inputs of all the participants, you can just make an independent funding transaction to the coordinator, like for a coin swap, that none of the other coin swap participants see. So the, the person you're paying never sees your input and then the coordinator takes another output of its own and the person you're paying just gets the output registration credential and gets their output in one of those successive coin swap transactions and gets paid without them even having a chance to see your input in this transaction. And, you know, this is just literally kind of fusing like this whole proposal, multiple independent um, privacy um, techniques or protocols um, in the works right now. And yeah, um, <coughs> we, we are in a fucking renaissance for Bitcoin privacy right now. And it's starting to get a little crazy to see. Yep. Ah, boy. Developers, slow the hell down. It's getting hard to keep up. Alrighty. So I think um, some government institutions got yelled at. Yeah, uh, before I go into that, there was one thing I kind of wanted to mention during the whole criticism of uh, mobile wallets. Uh, something that will become relevant next year, which I haven't seen too many people talking about. Um, I saw it through the Guardian project, but uh, there was a kind of developer... Uh, news site slash mailing list thing which uh, talked about an upcoming change to Android apps and I think it's important to highlight this. Um, basically it says um, in 2018 Google introduced an alternative app distribution format called the Android app bundle with the file extension .aab. The goal of the Android app bundle is to reduce the file size of the final Android application package delivered to the user, reducing the installation size and download time for users. The um, AAB file contains AP APK files for the base application, all supported architectures, languages, and layout formats or la layout variants. Uh, this format requires giving a copy of your app's signing key to Google, so the Google Play developer console can generate a bundle with signed versions of each APK in the bundle. The correct APK for a particular device's architecture, language, and layout are delivered via Google Play dynamic delivery. Yeah, so basically any new apps that, uh, that come out next year I, uh, assuming I read this correctly, this will not apply to existing apps, but if you are going to develop an Android wallet for Bitcoin and, or any wallet for Android or any app for Android, um, yeah, it sounds like you're going to have to give your signing key to Google, which um, I don't know about you, but I would not be comfortable with that. I mean, I'm not comfortable with phones in general, but yeah. That's going to be very interesting. Hello, F-Droid. What? Yeah. You don't know what that is? You should learn. That's fun. But yes, uh, regarding uh, people who are getting yelled at. Um, so in episode 223, we talked about how Coinbase is potentially offering blockchain surveillance services to the IRS and DEA. And it turns out uh, that Bitcoiners are not the only ones who have substantial distrust and disgust with the DEA. Um, on June 17th, the U.S. Department of Justice Office of the Inspector General released a redacted version of the audit they performed on the DEA's, uh, quote, income generating undercover operations, which are referred, to, are referred to as Attorney General Exempted Operations, or AGEOs. 
Uh, and while concluding that all AGEOs uh, at the GAA will require additional oversight, according to their report, they also note specifically that the DEA did not establish strict internal controls, risk mitigation techniques, and appro appropriate record keeping practices for AGEOs involving virtual currency, which we believe increased the potential for fraud, waste, abuse, and unauthorized investigative activity. Who could have guessed? Um, they are critical that despite the DEA uh, seeing an exponential increase in cases that involve virtual currency in the past few years, uh, quote, we found the DEA devoted only two DEA headquarter employees within, um, I don't remember this, what this acronym stands for, but OGF uh, to the DEA's virtual currency initiative. Two, two people. Um, and they also uh, highlight the Silk Road uh, investigation as a significant event that um, has not stimulated any changes. Uh, they say, during our review of virtual currency activity in AGEOs, we found that the DEA's management of virtual currency related activities was insufficient due to inadequate headquarters management, lack of policies, inadequate internal control procedures, insufficient uh, supervisory oversight, and lack of training. This deficiency occurred more than two years after a former DEA special agent was convicted of stealing $700,000 in virtual currency during a joint task force investigation of the dark web marketplace Silk Road. While this investigation was not an AGEO, we are concerned that the following uh, that following this incident, the DEA did not implement additional internal controls specifically related to investigations involving virtual currency. So basically what they are saying is that, um, and, and keep in mind, the, the Silk Road was, was relatively prominent and the, 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 the suspicion that it was probably in being investigated, probably becoming a target for takedown was also rel relatively prevalent, at least at the time in the, the Bitcoin space and other, other cryptocurrencies. So imagine when you're dealing with a less significant target, like an individual uh, or something like that, which is not going to get, there's not going to be as much concern or potential for concern about some investigations in comparison to others. So the fact that they have, according to the Justice Department, they have done nothing to mitigate the possibility of something like Silk Road happening again should scare the shit out of people. Because one of the things they also mention is that they were uh, not satisfied with how the DEA was handling um, basically... Uh, I don't remember how they phrased it, but like they, they are investigating someone and then at some point they may determine that maybe this person is not the right target um, or that the investigation is no longer worthwhile because they couldn't find a criminal activity and they didn't exactly have a way of like a very clear and, you know, <laughs> uh, they didn't have a very clear way of basically de-escalating that to like making clear that this person was no longer investigation and having a very obvious cutoff point for like, if these conditions are not satisfied, we should stop. That should scare people because that means that Coinbase is going to be providing blockchain surveillance tools. And in addition to all of the other powers, the DEA has gotten recently to literally investigate outside of the realm of drug related offenses, which is literally their entire, like they're called the drug enforcement administration. They focus on drugs. They've been given the power to go beyond that. Um, this should scare the shit out of people because they don't know what they're doing. And especially when you have companies like Chainalysis who are very, very, very much, um, talking themselves up about their ability to, they claim they don't identify people, but they're, they are, they're talking themselves up about their ability to do that or to help others do that, even if they don't intend that with their software. Um, you are going to have people being mistargeted um, at the very least. And it's going to be by an agency that the DOJ has said has a potential for fraud, waste, abuse, and unauthorized investigative activity. Like, 
that should scare people. I think I'm going to start time stamping like the op return outputs in all my Bitcoin transactions that say things like Flocka Empire seed round one. That I, and I'll put that in, in my transaction buying coffee. Well, uh, if you do that, then uh, who knows? M might end up on the desk of the one of two guys who is responsible for uh, the virtual currency initiative at the DEA. That was also so one of one of the things uh, that they said directly because I mentioned that um, they were criticized for not having the proper training. Um, they specifically said that I don't know if they were because you know there's redacted parts, things blacked out. So I'm not sure if they were specifically referring to the two guys that are supposedly running this virtual currency initiative. But they were saying that people who are involved in those investigations were having to ask their peers for help about how to deal with material. I don't know if that means keys. I don't know if that means like the output of blockchain surveillance software that they were using, but it, they were just, they had so little training that they were having to ask their peers how, how stuff worked, which, <laughs> which I mean, in one way, that's great. That's in a way that could be great news because it means that they just don't know what the hell they're doing. On the other hand, they're still making decisions about enforcing law and it's not like uh, there has never been a case where someone has been unjustly imprisoned or targeted uh, to later uh, have it later found out to be that they were completely innocent. Um, so that is also it's funny, but it's also scary because they have the power to do things without evidence. Epic. That's it. Just just epic. Regulatory compliance, people. Oh boy. Well, what what else is going on that's uh very shadily tied to very shady people? Yeah. So, speaking of uh government agencies and the people who work for them, uh BlockFi recently announced that they have hired a new chief security officer, CSO, named Adam Healy. Uh, now, the biggest question I have before I go any further, they say new chief security officer. Um, I have still to this day not been able to find out who their previous, if any, if there was a previous <laughs> security officer was. Um, I just have this very sinking feeling that this may be their first security officer. Um, I will let that sit there but anyway they say that they have hired a new chief security officer in an effort toward uh strengthening our commitment to security uh and if, for anyone who hasn't heard last month blockfi disclosed to customers poorly that their personal information had been breached supposedly as the result of a sim swap attack on an employee's phone this unauthorized third party then used their, the employee credentials to access a portion of BlockFi's encrypted back office system, according to them, and the personally identifiable information, um, which BlockFi says they typically use for retail marketing purposes, included names, email addresses, birth dates, postal addresses, and account activity history. They have still, to this day, not published any notice about this on their website and in fact the first mention of it besides the incident report that you can't find unless you you know looked at it like it's publicly available on their website but it's it's unlisted it's not it's not linked anywhere when you go to their website so the only way you could find it is by reading news articles that talk about it um or getting it from someone it was emailed to um, but yeah, so Healy in the announcement, uh, or actually no, in a second blog post that he's recently written, he mentions it as the recent SIM swap attack when he's talking about his plans for a security program at BlockFi. And I just found that really interesting. He calls it the, the recent SIM swap attack and then the security incident. No other description. So anyone who is first hearing about this will be like, what are you talking about SIM swap incident? Um... I just feel like, you know, I mean, even CoinSquare, uh, as I think that was talked about in 
at least one recent episode, but Coin Square at least eventually <laughs> published uh, something about the hack and or data breach to their actual website where people could find it. Um, BlockFi has not done so. This is the first time that they're even mentioning it. Um, but anyway, as a, as Chief Security Officer Healy will be responsible for leading and strengthening BlockFi's security-first approach across the organization, which includes protecting client data, digital assets, and other proprietary information. His work will span cybersecurity and physical security. And uh, in describing their new hire, uh, BlockFi notes that Healy's prior employers include the U.S. Intelligence Community, Department of Defense, Microsoft, and Palantir Technologies. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, Palantir was founded in 2003, and they build data analytics products for corporate surveillance, counterterrorism, immigration enforcement, and predictive policing programs. Um, an early investor in Palantir was the CIA's Incutel Venture Capital Fund, uh, the same one which provided strategic investment to the precursor Google Maps and Earth, which is something I mentioned before in a blog post. But um, uh, if you want two very succinct descriptions that will tell you a lot about Palantir, uh, in a, a Wired article about them, it says, when enough jurisdictions join Palantir's interconnected web of police departments, government agencies, and databases, the resulting data trove resembles a pay-to-access social network, a Facebook of crime that's both invisible and largely unaccountable to the citizens whose behavior it tracks. Uh, and then in a Forbes article, um, there was a book called The Finish written by Mark Bowden, and it says, in the book, The Finish, detailing the killing of Osama bin Laden, author Mark Bowden writes that Palantir software actually deserves the popular designation killer app. Awkward. Um, so then, you know, I looked, I looked around for more detail because I'm like, well, U.S. intelligence community, um, that is a big thing to put on your resume. So it appears that according to his LinkedIn profile, his first foray into the intelligence community appears to be as an analyst for the Virginia-based Science Applications International Corporation, or SA SAIC, which is a government services contractor. Um, he did this from August 2006 to June 2007. Of course, uh, this uh, company is mentioned in WikiLeaks, uh, so if you want to find more interesting information about them there and what things they've gotten up to... Um, you can also get an idea of what they do by reading the resumes of their other employees and contractors on the IC Watch database, which is uh, publicly available. And uh, so his work for Palantir was as a cybersecurity strategist, and that lasted from February 2014 to, Mark, uh, or to May 2016, uh, apparently based around New York. And then between September 2009 and August 2012, he was employed by the vague uh, designation U.S. government. It does not specify any particular agency or department, but um, I uh, checked around in the IC Watch database and I found his name and email. And his email is adamhealy at ic.fbi.gov. Um, so that probably indicates that the FBI was probably at least one of them or he was somehow involved with them, maybe through Palantir, don't know. But yeah, um, on the bright side, this guy does know uh, what it feels like to have uh, your name and email address breached. I don't know whether to take this as they're getting serious or the I don't trust that company with dick shit in terms of personal information now. Um, well, I would personally skew more towards the latter because... Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what his uh, existing connections, if there are any, may be towards Plantier, but is you entirely... don't ever lose connections in a world like that. That's not how yeah. that works. Yeah, one, one, once a uh, once a contractor spy, always a contractor spy, and also like 
it is also a normal thing for you to be employed by one company and then when you go to the next you recommend the products and services of the previous company that you used to work for and um if you want to have uh if you want to have an insight into what that experience may be like uh one of uh, i don't I'll, I'll make sure to link it in the description i don't think it's linked right now but uh there was an article i think bloomberg uh, which is mostly focusing on one particular notorious person from Plantier who was running the uh, running the services with um, J.P. Morgan when Plantier. I don't know if they still use them, but when they were prominently using them, um, let's just say they do some very interesting shit. Um, including literally just sucking up every possible piece of data they possibly can on your on your like wh whoever's an employee at your company, uh, they're going to suck up as much information as possible. They may, uh, if you, for instance, come into work late, put you on a at-risk list for potentially being a whistleblower, at which point they will monitor you even more. And they may even get to the point of, um, of stalking you physically. Uh, that is that is the uh, physical security aspect of the service that Palantir uh, would offer, and there was even a funny moment in the article where the a lot of the employees were suspecting that all of their emails were basically getting uh, basically getting sucked up and analyzed, and so they deliberately started putting um, false or you know not serious stuff into it to see if it would get mentioned during meetings and it was being mentioned according to the source um which yeah that is that is what you're going to get uh, when you when you don't actually trust your employees um and you start supply you start applying relatively harsh no privacy conditions to their ability to perform their job they are they are going to resist that mm -hmm. so um yeah i don't i can't say that uh you know whoever whoever uh works at blockfi now um you you might be up for a fun time not to mention that there's jobs out there whose whole job is to go get a second job and then do your first job at that second job. Mm-hmm. Anyway, though, uh, you want to slide along into this BitMEX research? Mm-hmm. So... This is a pretty thorough research uh, piece on the current state of the entire mining ecosystem. And I'm going to take a second to toot my own horn and say this is reinforcing pretty much all the things I've been screaming for years. Um, <laughs> so first up, um, the minor efficiency in terms of joules per terahash is still continuing the inverse step down i guess of the the log of bitcoin's price but at the the current state of things uh pretty much micro bt uh the producer of the what's miner and bitmain are neck and neck on the bleeding edge of efficiency and everybody else is a giant leap behind um in a silicon ebay canon and you know for the most part everybody's financials are in a real shit show situation um particularly companies like canon and ebay um with very inefficient hardware compared to what uh micro bt and bitmain are producing um have not only had losses just through um revenue and profit margins but massive write downs on inefficient hardware that's just not worth as much on the market so they're really getting slammed and you know another major shift is really bitmain is is still you know like i said their their latest generation of mining equipment is pretty much on par or slightly ahead of micro bts but they've lost a massive amount of market share over the last three years. 
they they used to represent somewhere around 75 percent of the mining hardware out there and right now they're only really around like maybe 45 40 percent and micro bt in the last fucking three years has relatively exploded from somewhere like five to ten percent of the market to around 35 um percent of the the mining market out there so they're really neck and neck and given uh micro bt's progress in terms of electrical efficiency um it was actually founded for anybody who doesn't remember by the lead engineer who designed the uh amp miner s9 at bitmain um they're probably going to leap ahead in their next generation of bitmain's efficiency and you know this is really just a consolidating market at this point and a lot of the demand in terms of um, this equipment is doing two major things um, one shifting slowly and steadily out of china in terms of people actually operating uh, mining farms and consolidating in terms of the these companies are all for the most part reporting um dealing with less and less customers who are ordering uh, much larger groupings of uh, miners to set up and so we're, we're kind of seeing that that point where the market is naturally itself consolidating up and given the very tight financial situations for a lot of these companies um you know we're hopefully shifting into a, an upward moving market but that's inevitably going to hit a top and come down again and i think these companies at this point um they know what that means they know the shifting market dynamics so i think it, it literally is a matter of time before these companies just start closing themselves off to retail uh consumers and just starting to vertically consolidate with mining farm operators um and it's it's really just inevitable i mean who, who can argue it at this point oh and um Another uh, quick update on a mining company that was not covered in the BitMEX research, actually. Um, Tal, um, which was previously known as Squire LTD, um, Calvin Ayers uh, Mining Company and ASIC Manufacturer, um, <laughs> just released their figures for quarter one of 2020. Um their operating losses are almost a, a million dollars <laughs> and given the nature of um their declarations of assets vaguely as digital assets um there is really no way of telling whether they're mining btc or bsv and if if all of the uh i think f how much hold on one second all of the um, $3 million of digital assets on their books, um, if it is BSV, is just a matter of time before it compounds into way more losses on the books than they currently have. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, at this point, I'm really starting to think that Calvin is too stupid to you know mine btc as a rational economic player um with most of his equipment so i think it's going to be really hilarious to see the the bsv version of the mining company get wrecked like that main was for bcash <laughs> Alrighty, janine want to take us into the flip-flopping ccp front company yeah, so uh, one of the not so related to Bitcoin stories that we've been covering over the last few weeks uh, is what is going on with Zoom and why you shouldn't trust it. Uh, we previously talked about this in episode 214, 219, 222, and 224, which was the last episode, and uh, we've got another update. 
uh, because three days ago, Zoom announced the following. Since releasing the draft design of Zoom's end-to-end -end encryption, E2EE, on May 22nd, we have engaged with civil liberties organizations, um, our CISO council, child safety advocates, um, I thought they were just in general safety advocates, anyway, uh, encryption experts, and government representatives, our own users and others to gather feedback on this feature. We have also explored new technologies to, <laughs> new technologies to enable us to offer end-to-end -to -end encryption to all tiers of users. Um, you will be amazed by this new technology. Um, so today, uh, Zoom released an update on their end-to-end -to -end encryption design on GitHub. We are also pleased to share that we have identified a path for that balances the legitimate right of all users to privacy and the safety of users on our platform, as if they're somehow not synonymous. Uh, privacy is also about safety. This will enable us to offer end-to-end -end encryption as an advanced add-on feature for all of our users around the globe, free and paid, while maintaining the ability to prevent and fight abuse on our platform. And they say that they will accomplish this um, by having free or unregistered user. Well, actually, I don't remember if they clarified whether it was also unregistered, but free, at least, users um, will be able to verify themselves via a phone number um, where they send you a text message. Uh, and they say end-to-end -end encryption will be an optional feature as it limits some meeting functionality, such as the ability to include traditional phone lines um, or other uh, specific hardware conference room systems. Hosts will toggle end-to-end -end encryption on or off on a per-meeting basis, and account administrators can enable and disable end-to-end -end encryption at the account and group level. Um, Yes, so it's not only interesting that they consider uh, uh, text message verification to be a new technology worth uh, describing it that way, but uh, it's also interesting in terms of a turnaround from uh, we must keep pedophiles off our platform uh, and we will do so by requiring them to pay for our service. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, we're willing to let anyone use our service if they can let us send them a text message. And that that will also accomplish that. Um, it's just it's just so bizarre, the 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 flippy floppy. Honk honk. I promise we're not a CCP front company. Honk honk. Also, um, they didn't say this, but I'm pretty sure that the thing about uh, having you verify with a text message and phone number, uh, that is probably not going to be abused in order to block participants from certain countries that are trying to clamp down on free speech of their citizens. Hong Kong. Yeah. Um... Yeah. Really, um, I need to start memeing everybody who is still using Zoom. I need to do it. It just I need to just start grabbing screenshots and memeing every individual viciously and brutally. I need to do it. Yeah, I mean, I've... I have only used the browser version on a few occasions because that was the only option offered to me to do podcast interviews, but uh sorry, in the future I'm I am not going to do that because first of all, I would never I would never be able to trust Zoom's end-to-end -end encryption anyway for at, like meetings that I actually cared about the privacy of. Um, all of the times, the, the few times that I have used Zoom, I've used the browser version, and it's been exclusively for functions where I knew the entire conversation was going to be published because it was for a podcast, so I didn't care about the privacy aspect of that, and that's that was the only condition under which I was going to use it. I was never, I would never use Zoom under the expectation that anything would actually be private. Um, I mean, I still think they should try, like, hey, might as might as well try and uh, cut back on the very stupid anti-encryption arguments that they've been making over the past several weeks. But yeah, I'm increasingly not feeling comfortable with even using it just for public stuff either. 
This is what an information war looks like, boys and girls. Stop. Use Jitsi. Just stop surrendering. Alrighty, so um, yeah, what what's going on with the Open Technology Fund? Uh, so I have not. I have not dug too deep into this, but a lot of people are talking about, especially open source developers um, and a lot of also privacy projects as well. But for anyone doesn't who doesn't know, the Open Technology Fund or OTF is, um, I'm basically just going to read the description from Wikipedia because it's succinct and as far as I know, every single aspect of it is true, which is not always the case with Wikipedia, but in this case it works. Um, they're basically an American nonprofit company with the aim to support global, well, caveat, the, the their stated aim is correct. Whether they are actually doing that is not so clear, but um, they have the aim to support global internet freedom technologies. Its mission is to support open technologies and communities that increase free expression, circumvent censorship, and obstruct repressive surveillance as a way to promote human rights and open societies. As of November 2019, they uh, became an independent grantee corporation um, of or under the U.S. Agency for Global Media, uh, which, by the way, there is all this stuff involving Hillary Clinton being involved in the formation of this thing and U.S. foreign policy and all of that great stuff, which I'm not going to get into. Um, that is a that is a large topic. But um, anyway, that's just in case you don't know who they are. Um, basically, what happened in the last couple of days is that the head of the OTF, um, which handles this funding, basically resigned on Wednesday. Um, and this is from the Vice article, which uh, published the... I think almost the entire email, but she said that she became aware of a lobbying effort that would push the OTF's funds toward closed source tools rather than the open source ones it has traditionally championed. Um, some of those, uh, some of those tools include Tor, it includes Ricochet, um, and a bunch of others. Uh, probably, it is very likely that if you're if you're using an open source, um, especially privacy focus tool it has probably at some point received funding from the open technology fund um and so in the resignation email sent to the mailing list libby Liu, the inaugural otf ceo mentioned that the trump administration had recently sworn in michael peck as the new head of the u.s agency for global media the thing that i mentioned before that they're a uh they're an independent grantee corporation under them, but still connected to them. Uh, it stands for, or, or the acronym is USAGM. And they're the grantor of OTF. And she said that she learned of lobbying efforts to push money to a clo to closed source tools. Uh, in the email, she says, as you all know, OTF's flexible, transparent, and competitive funding model has been essential to our success in supporting the most secure and effective internet freedom technologies and innovative projects available. Um, I have become aware of having efforts to convince the new U.S. AGM uh, CEO to interfere with the current uh, OTF funding stream and redirect some of our resources to a few closed source circumvention tools. And I also saw a thing about how not sh not only is she resigning, but other other board members have either resigned or been fired. I haven't checked because, like I said, I haven't looked deeply into this, but it sounds like this is a rather significant shakeup. Um, and, you know, regardless, of, I mean, there's a number of people who do not like OTF and think that it's uh, kind of, uh, well, let's say there's been a lot of canaries in the coal mine with whether whether it actually does what it says. But regardless, um, if they are going to be redirecting funding away from open source projects, that is going to be affecting a number of things. It's going to be affecting the Tor project. It's going to be affecting um a lot a lot of applications that people use and rely on and um yeah this this is going to be a big deal regardless of whether you think having this kind of organization funding a lot of these projects is a model to begin with which um there are a lot of good arguments for that but this is something that's going to come up because they have been a big money machine in the space 
Mm -hmm. And when big projects like that get resource strapped, you know, things start falling behind and that start having, or starts having systemic consequences. Yeah, and I would also want to point out um, someone who's been responding to this news is um, Sarah Jamie Lewis, who runs the Open Privacy Research um, Society, and they're they're developing um, privacy uh, enhancing applications and tools. And actually, she um, Open Priv is one of the few uh, organizations that um, either hasn't i don't i don't think they've actually ever accepted i don't know if they've ever accepted money from otf but they certainly don't rely on them as a main funder she talked about why independent fun she's tweeted recently about why independent funding is so important for these kinds of tools because to have the rug pulled out from under you like this is going to be a big deal um and it's she she talks about why independent funding is also not that there are caveats and cons to that, um, that, you know, that can make funding be rather unreliable and inconsistent. You have to be chasing, um, you have to, it's like, cause we're still consumers are not in the mindset yet to be paying for the services they use. And it's, well, some of them, even if they are in the mind it, to do that, it's hard for them to pay for them because our payments with, especially with fiat suck, um, especially on a recurring basis, uh, also for cryptocurrencies. But um, as far as I know, OpenPriv is still doing um, independent funding only. Mm -hmm. It's definitely going to shake things up. Speaking of shakeups, though, uh, so this was actually a really uh, silly thing uh, involving people just running away with themselves. So th th there was a, a whole shenanigans on the 15th about a massive DDoS attack on all kinds of infrastructure in the U.S., uh, all the mobile carriers, uh, the ISPs, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, yeah, all of it stems to a site that is set up to kind of look at DDoS attacks going on right now. And it's also um, apparently used as a sales pitch for DDoS protection services. Um, so it exaggerates the hell out of things in the... Uh, you know the the way it displays it infographically and there there were ddos attacks going on but nothing insane or out of control at all and what really ticked all of this off is just one network t-mobile um they were going through a network upgrade and somebody screwed something up and so all of the services out there that report um, outages for different services, people who had T-Mobile and had the, the network for T-Mobile go down, um, started reporting all of these services as down too. And this just kind of snowballed. Um, and so pretty much, um, you know, Matthew Prince, the, the CEO of Cloudflare, one of the biggest CDNs in the world, um, they're hooked up to all of the the major global networks um, and internet exchange points. And during this whole fiasco, um, nobody except T-Mobile was having any kind of network issues. None of the major international exchange um, routing points had any massive surges in traffic. Um, this was just T-Mobile screwing up a network upgrade. But it spun out of control so fast um, that half of Twitter was screaming that the entire United States was being DDoS. And, you know, again, people right now need to stop just running away with the first thing without digging in a little bit. Like, th this literally took all of five minutes to put together and find out that was not what is going on. 
Yeah, I but... believe I saw uh I believe I saw malware text saying that it was the highlight of his day to read an email of someone explaining uh how the US was not being <laughs> attacked. <laughs> yeah, like you you would know if something like that were actually going on because you wouldn't be able to get on to any outage report site from any connection to report anything because that would actually be happening yeah it's it's kind of like uh when uh t when twitter has some disruption in service in like you know certain parts of the world and then you get you get people tweeting twitter is down twitter is down no just your area is fucked up for a bit <laughs> <laughs> but yeah um ironically though um this kind of jumps into um a really awesome early proposal for bitcoin core to deal with situations like stuff like that actually happening um so yeah um hold on one second i just want to find this guy's name correctly um Ariard um who I've never heard of before um proposed a, a major change to Bitcoin core and the creation of a, a new subsystem ultimately to completely generalize um alternative transport layers uh for Bitcoin so the like the actual peer to peer protocol used to pass bitcoin data around um and you know there's actually quite a few of them out there um like gotenna has their um transaction tenna system that they collaborated with samurai wallet for uh matt corallo developed the fiber protocol for faster relaying between miners um blockstream has a fork of that um fiber changed and optimized for their satellite feed but all of these things are pretty much independent forks of bitcoin core to implement these independent transport layers and so what ariad is proposing is creating an optional um subsystem called altnet um that you would actually have to flag on um when building um to kind of generalize outside of the the baked in base peer-to-peer -peer protocol that exists right now um a general subsystem that could just call to completely different um transport layers for things like blocks or transaction propagation and he actually has a very basic um proof of concept implementation using the lightning network um transport protocol to pass blocks or block headers around but you know a generalized thing like this could also um look at matt carello's recent proposal to feed block headers directly over dns or the the laura mesh net um that um you know projects are working on in venezuela um local wi-fi bluetooth um, ham radio um, different transport layers over tor or i2p um, you know other mesh net protocols um, and just have like a, a generalized um, service and system that could plug into libraries for any of those um, and have a, a way to kind of communicate the limitations of each one you know like maybe this mesh network can't actually handle passing blocks because the bandwidth is too low just transactions um maybe this connection you know a, a satellite link from blockstream is only one way you can only receive things and just you know a general um protocol in in this new subsystem to handle the different limitations or, or uses for all these different transport layers so that they could work directly with Bitcoin Core itself. 
rather than each of these new transport layers pretty much having new maintenance burden as a fork, um, changing the trust dynamics and assumptions. Um, you know, like to use the satellite feed that that software is developed by Blockstream um, to use fiber. Um, Corello maintains that, you know, every time you tweak um, these transport layers, you're, you're trusting a new project now as far as the code base. And, you know, this is just a very early proposal. Um, and in the pull request, like there doesn't seem to be any outright um you know, hostility to the idea, but this would be a massive amount of work to actually get done with the trade-off of it being a lot easier to maintain um, in the long term. And, you know, this is something I would really like to see. Like, th this would be awesome if, you know, to use the, the satellite um, feed from Blockstream, you don't have to run a whole different core instance or, or, or fork. But like to be able to just dynamically plug that in with a, a mesh network node you have or cross check headers only through some other way and to all have that, you know, still be wrapped in the, the core developer group as far as eyes on it and the amount of cross checking going on rather than just a side project off on its own. So you know, I, I'm going to be paying close attention to this and anybody else interested, I think you should too. Like this could wind up being a whole new, um, you know, architectural piece of core in the long term. And I think that would be an insanely useful thing. Alrighty. So I guess final thoughts for the day, unless you got something to, to rant about transport layers. Uh, nope. Uh, do you want to go first with final thought or? Well, I'm going to tack a silly one on at the end, but you know, I do kind of want to just say, um, I hope everybody has seen, uh, since the last episode, the resolution of Peter Todd's lawsuit with, uh, Lovecraft. But, you know, I just want to say, I, I am insanely disappointed and just think it is outright manipulative as hell to engage in, in a settlement, withdraw direct accusations, and then immediately just go back to slandering somebody. Like literally the day that she issues the retraction of past direct accusations um, as part of the settlement of the lawsuit. Like, it is so unethical and manipulative. And it's just, I really hope that people out there see that. Because, like, th this is fucked up. Like, just slinging accusations like that, um, especially baselessly, in my opinion, it, that that destroys people's lives and that's just fucked up well the the concerning part to me so first i want to point out because i i've followed this case since it started um and i just want to point out the settlement agreement which peter published did not say that either party had to retract any statement so the statement that was published was not a retraction and there's a lot of debate about what what they should have said and what should have been agreed that was said as part of the settlement um but i just want to point out there there was a bit of confusion there wasn't actually any retraction and that wasn't asked for as part of the settlement but i do think that if if two parties in a case come to a settlement agreement, um, I think it, it does not reflect well if one of the parties in less than 24 hours after that settlement is published and people are aware of the settlement to, I mean, it's not acceptable under any situation, but it's especially not acceptable when you've come to a settlement agreement and within less than 24 hours, you 
make death threats against the other party because you are not satisfied with how it went. Um, I, death threats and saying that people should be killed and enc encouraging others to kill people, I think we can all agree, is not a good faith way to to conclude a settlement that was supposedly on paper agreed to amicably. Mm -hmm. So yeah, do you uh you got any other uh thoughts to toss out for the day before I take us out in a very trolly manner? Yes I do. One second. I have to get it really quick. Yeah, so I was I was originally um when I was trying to think of a final thought, I was going to mention the very, I, it's not uh, exactly the onion, but it's like ba ba Babylon news or something. It's something similar to the onion. Babylon. Uh, yeah. And so one of the images they posted recently was a go ghostly image of George Orwell uh, floating above the U.S. Capitol saying, I told you so. Um <laughs> Which, yeah, that's perfect. But actually, the thing that I want to mention instead, um, that wasn't a news item, but uh, I was looking at because it's going to be in my newsletter, is that um, there is a core contributor, uh, Amiti, I think that's how, pro I didn't check how to pronounce her name correctly, but she is a core contributor and she's been working on the P2P layer of Bitcoin and improving that and specifically looking at um how rebroadcasting behavior can be a privacy leak in terms of the fact that at, at the moment when you rebroadcast a transaction that has not been confirmed yet, you are kind of advertising to the network that that transaction was probably yours because nodes don't, at the moment they don't, they wouldn't rebroadcast transactions that are not theirs and they're not, you know, they're not trying to get out. so. She's working on trying to fix that so that that's not, you know, a a flag of which node is the originator of which transaction. Um, but um, she is being uh, being honored for that work because on June eighteenth, um, the OK Coin and um, well, I mean, I thought of it because of the Bitmex story, but OK Coin and the holding company of Bitmex. Uh, or the company that runs BitMEX is uh, going to be granting her $150,000 for 12 months of work on, um, quote, increasing test coverage for the P2P layer to ensure a robust code base. And she said that this grant will enable her to continue the mission of making the Bitcoin network more reliable, private, and understandable uh, for the benefit of everyone. So that's really cool because that's... Uh, in line with um, the Human Rights Foundation also making the first grant to Chris Belker to work on CoinSwap, and I wanted to mention this as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually saw that. That was pretty awesome. But yeah, on that note, uh, I guess that's it for the day, punks. And hashtag Bitcoin millionaires, hashtag Bitcoin trillionaires, hashtag Bitcoin billionaires, hashtag Bitcoin, hashtag Bitcoin, hashtag Bitcoin, hashtag Bitcoin. Hey, Sidney. Yeah, Sidney. It is so good, yeah.